Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Radcliffe Chambers seminar, uh, Third Party Cost Orders Against Insurers, Where Do Things Stand After Travellers? Um, I'm Jeremy Cousins, and with me on the panel today um, is Shantanu Majamdar, QC. Um, Shantanu uh, was counsel um, for uh, the claimants in the Jambroni case, which we will be coming to later on this morning. Um, he did the case as a very senior junior on his own, uh, successfully uh, recovering a, a substantial award for his clients. Um, and then uh, he went on successfully to seek a Section 51 costs order against the insurers who had represented the um, professional uh, clients um, uh, in uh, that case. Um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Justice Foskett uh, made an order um, as sought uh, substantially by Chantanou on that occasion. There was then an appeal to the Court of Appeal uh, which was brought by the insurers. But in the meantime, uh, the well-known XYZ and Travellers case reached the Supreme Court, and ultimately the Jan Brony case uh, did not reach the Court of Appeal. It, uh, um, terms were uh, reached so that that did not occur. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, Chantanou had uh, uh, brought me in um, as the leader in the case for the Court of Appeal. So we both worked on the Jan Brone case, uh, unfortunately not for as long as uh, we might have done had it gone the whole distance, uh, but we had the uh, experience of working together on these very problems. So we're very glad to be able to share thoughts with you um, about this whole problem of Section 51 orders against insurers uh, and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about this morning. So from the introduction to the substance, um, if we could have the first screen, please, the introduction screen, thank you. Um, in what circumstances will a liability insurer be uh, able to be ordered to uh, pay a non-party costs order, because of course the insurers are not themselves normally parties to litigation any more than a litigation funder is. Ordinarily, as you will know from experience, that problem does not arise. It's very, very rare, because where costs are made in favor of a claimant against an insured defendant, normally the, the insurers just pay up and even if there is a coverage problem as between insurer and insured, well, provided that the insured has got the means to pay, the, the costs order can be directly enforced against the insured. Problem, what happens if there is a dispute between insured and insurer about uh, whether or not there is cover and what happens if the insured can't pay? Can the costs that have been incurred by the successful claimant in which he's been ordered to recover from the defendant be recovered from the insurer? And in what circumstances? Could we move on to the next slide? Um, it is this uh, issue which is the subject that we're going to be uh, looking at today. In particular, um, what is the scope for a costs order under Section 51 of the Senior Courts Act 1981 or under the court's inherent jurisdiction? Um, we're looking at cost liabilities, not liabilities to satisfy orders to pay damages. And, and the next slide, please. Um, there can be other ways, I'm sure you've all come across this at different times, there can be other ways that insurers can be held liable directly 
to the, a successful claimant. Um, the best known route is under the Third Party Rights Against Insurers Act 2010. Um, that's a jurisdiction that's been around since 1930 under the predecessor statute. Um, uh, there's also a, a, a rather less well-known route, but it still can be a very valuable one, of seeking the appointment of a receiver by way of equitable execution under CPR 69. And that, in those circumstances, when the court makes such an order, the receiver stands in the shoes of the insured and can be, uh, and can be ordered. Um, the, the receiver uh, can get an order uh, which can be enforced as though brought by the insured itself so that the insurer has to pay out under the policy. Uh, but those routes to recovery have distinct limitations. Um, insurers will only be liable to the extent that they have a contractual obligation to indemnify. If they have got some valid policy point that they can run, that will defeat any attempt to recover from the insurers either under the 2010 Act or uh, under uh, the receivership. Um, I, I, it, this is not the occasion on which to discuss personal injury cases where um, monies can still be recovered for a successful claimant from the Motor Insurers Bureau. That's a very distinct and um, specialist class of case and not, not any of the problems that we're going to be looking at um, this morning. But let's suppose that an insurer has become involved in litigation even though there are policy points as between insurer and insured. And this does sometimes happen because the insurer might want to defend a case, not because they necessarily want to pay out or say they should have to pay out. They might want to defend just in case an insurance dispute is ultimately resolved against them so that they do have to pay out. And by participating in defending a claim, they can uh, guard against a potential liability that they should have in the event that the insurance dispute should be resolved against them. And in doing so, of course, they may take many points. Some of them may be brilliant points. Some of them may not be so good. Some of them may be utterly hopeless. Some of them may have been cynically pursued for uh, other reasons. So. Uh, supposing that an insurer um, is involved in litigation, supposing that the costs are driven up as a result of that, um, in what circumstances can the insurer be held liable? Could we have the next slide, please? So what we are looking at is the court's power to order costs against a non-party under Section 51, rather than to order costs which depend simply on rights under the policy. So it's Section 51 that we are going to focus on now. And the next slide, please. The statutory power is contained in Section 51 of the 1981 Act. There were uh, predecessor provisions. Um, materially, the section provides as follows. Subject to the provisions of this or any other enactment and to rules of court, the costs of and incidental to all proceedings shall be in the discretion of the court. The court shall have full power to determine by whom and to what extent the costs are to be paid. Well, that's a pretty wide power, isn't it? It would suggest that the court really can identify anybody as somebody deserving of paying the costs, uh, whether they've been uh, involved in the case or not. Well, it won't surprise anybody to know uh, that uh, that is uh, not the way that the court responds to an application under Section 51. It is necessary very much to justify any order for costs under Section 51. So could we move on to the next slide, please? The judgment of Lord Reed in the Travellers case in the Supreme Court shows that historically in England, 
both in equity and at common law, courts were prepared to make costs orders against non-parties who had intermeddled in the disputes of others or where they were the real parties to the litigation. Anybody interested in this or who's got a case to which this is relevant really does need to read the judgments of Lord Briggs and Lord Reed in particular in Travellers because they're very illuminating about this. The historical perspective has gone into um, in very considerable detail by Lord Reed. Um, and what he explains there, which is very interestingly, although before the late 19th century, the courts were perfectly willing to make the kind of orders that we're talking about today in defined circumstances, um, after the enactment of the Judicature Act in the 1870s, the courts held that they were unable any longer to exercise that jurisdiction and declined to do so. And remarkably, that went on for over a hundred years until the House of Lords decided the case of aid and shipping and interbulk, which firmly re-established the existence of the relevant jurisdiction. And gradually, uh, that jurisdiction has been reinvigorated since. In Scotland, the jurisdiction to award costs against a non-party who was uh, a dominus uh, litis, as it's described in Scotland, or the master of the litigation, never appears to have been doubted. There is a significance about all of this history, and indeed the, the Scottish law on this, because there are other jurisdictions um, where uh, English law essentially is uh, practiced, but which have a, a very high degree of influence um, from the civil law jurisdiction, and I'm thinking in particular of the Channel Islands. And there was a decision of the Jersey Court of Appeal in a case that I was involved in about 18 months ago, where we persuaded the Court of Appeal in Jersey um, in a case which was initiated by the Indonesian government and for whom the Attorney General for Jersey appeared, um, that where uh, the Indonesian government and the attorney lost the case, um, this history of jurisprudence, uh, which is highly relevant in, in Jersey, because of course you don't have the, the senior courts act there, this history of jurisprudence was relevant and enabled the court to make orders both against the attorney and against the Indonesian government. So there is a real relevance for this history. And in the civil law influence jurisdictions like Jersey, Guernsey, um, the, the fact that the Scots have always recognized this is particularly influential um, uh, and uh, indeed uh, prevailed in that particular case. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Um, looking at classic applications of the power in this jurisdiction, it's been exercised in many types of case um, in differing circumstances. We mentioned just a couple, a pre judicature act case in Reed Jones, uh, an order for costs made against a solicitor who had given an indemnity to a client to pursue an action, no doubt, because he hoped to gain some benefit from it himself. And uh, more recently, um, in the case of Coza and Coza Altin, the controller of a company um, was held liable for costs where company litigation uh, was directed for his benefit. Um, it's also uh, increasingly a power. Uh, exercised against litigation funders who stand to share in the proceeds of litigation. All of that fits into the the classical approach, the, the, the one well established before the Judicature Acts. Um, and uh, as Lord Brown put it in Dymox Finance, Franchise Systems and Todd, a Privy Council case on appeal from New, from New Zealand, um, where, however, the non-party not merely funds the proceedings, but substantially also controls, or at any rate is to benefit from them, justice will ordinarily require that if the proceedings fail, he will pay the successful party's costs. But um, although 
in litigation funder cases, um, there is a power to order a funder to pay all of the costs. As a matter of policy, as well as of practice, there has tended to be exercised um, a jurisdiction to cap the exposure of the funder to the limit of his contribution to costs. But that cap does not necessarily always have to be applied by the court. It's always going to depend on the circumstances. So where the jurisdiction is exercised, the power can be exercised in respect of some of the costs, all of the costs, or none of the costs. Now, I think at that point, we're moving on to the next slide, and uh, Shantanu is going to be um, telling you uh, something more uh, about this jurisdiction. Over to you, Shantanu. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, good morning. We're about to find out if the limit of my abilities is moving Jeremy's slides, because I'm now going to have to move my, my slides and um, talk to you about my part of this. Uh, and we're now turning, and Jeremy having sketched in the history and the general context of the exercise of this jurisdiction to the question of insurers, which of course is the subject matter uh, essentially of our talk today. Um, and Jeremy was just talking about those who fund litigation and insurers, of course, um, are serial funders of the litigation of others. Uh, now, prior to the decision of the Court of Appeal in XYZ and Travellers, uh, their position in relation to non-party cost orders was thought to be subject to um, a number of specific principles which had been developed and applied in a number of cases starting in the late 1990s. Um, and I list three of them there. Um, perhaps the most important was a case called Chapman and Christopher. Uh, and from those, the um, courts and the market um, derived what um, were often described as a matter of shorthand as the Chapman principles. Now, those appeared to establish that a liability insurer um, will be liable under Section 51 in either of two situations. Um, the first, and there's no particular order to this because they, they, they deal with two separate types of situation, is where the insurer had unjustifiably interfered in a dispute between others in which it had no interest. Um, and that was often referred to um, uh, shorthand as intermeddling. Uh, the other situation, is where, and it's the opposite in some senses, it was where it was interested in the outcome of the litigation and controlled and funded the proceedings, but in its own rather than in the insured's interest. And that was a really key aspect of that category of liability. Uh, and that was often referred to as the real defendant basis. Now I've mentioned XYZ and, tra uh, XYZ and Travelers and it's necessary just to uh, descend um, for a minute into the detail of the case. Um, because, of course, all these um, non-party cost cases are fact-sensitive, um, at least to some degree. Now, in um, Travellers, this was a product liability case, um, which involved um, 600 or so claims subject to a group litigation order against a manufacturer of breast implants called Transform. Now, 197 of those claims, um, those Transform claims, were insured by Travellers, but 426 were not. Now, the fact that there was no insurance in those 426 cases um, was not disclosed to those claimants until rather a late stage in the proceedings. Uh, and I think I recall, in fact, that the defendant, Transform, had been advised by counsel at a much earlier stage not to disclose the fact that there were these uninsured claims. Now, during the course of litigation, uh, the trial of preliminary issues was ordered and four sample cases were chosen. And two of the sample cases were, and, I, uh, and this was a complete accident, uninsured claims. Now, before moving on to what happened subsequently, um, I should say this, I mean, the GLO, the Group Litigation Order, provided two relevant things. First, that costs involved or incurred in dealing with common issues were to be shared equally between all GLO claims. Uh, and although, of course, it didn't specify this, I mean, that would apply to insured un and uninsured claims. Uh, and the second relevant provision, and this is a normal and sensible provision found in um, many of these orders, is that liability for and entitlement costs was several rather than joint. And we'll see in a moment why that was so significant in travellers. Now, subsequently, expert evidence um, emerged, which was adverse to the claimant's claims, 
Um, and that opened the door to travellers being able to do a deal with the insured, uh, in the insured claims. Uh, and that involved paying a proportion of the insured claimant's damages and costs. Now, the proportion of the common costs, and those were largely, of course, the costs relating to the sample cases, which were attributable to the insured claims, was calculated by dividing the number, the, the, dividing the amount of those costs by the number of insured claims relative to the total number of claims, um, which is a sentence which is quite hard to take in um, when you hear it for the first time, but it does make sense. Uh, and the upshot of this was that travellers paid about 20% of the common costs. Transform, of course, um, already having been teetering on the edge, uh, entered administration and the uninsured claimants obtained default judgment against it. Now their individual costs, the ones that were specifically attributable only to their claims, were very small, but the costs for which they were potentially liable under the GLA uh, were their proportion of the common costs of the four sample cases. And of course, these were not recovered or realistically recoverable from Transform. Uh, and that, of course, led to the uninsured claimants making a non-party costs um, application against travellers. Now, that application succeeded before the judge, Lady Justice Thurwall, as she had by then become. And she was particularly influenced in deciding that travellers um, should be liable by the fact that um, she found as a fact that had the uninsured claimants known the true insurance position at a much earlier stage of the proceedings, they would not have continued with their claims. Um, now, travellers appealed from that order at first instance, and um, the order was upheld by the Court of Appeal, um, albeit for slightly different reasons, and we'll come to those in a moment. Now, at both stages, travellers relied on the insurer cases, which I've mentioned, um, and travellers argued uh, three things. First of all, that what those cases showed that a liability insurer who funded an unsuccessful defence by its insured would only be liable um, if it was established by evidence that it had controlled the litigation in its own interest and without proper regard to any inconsistent or opposing interest of its insured. Um, and they said that only in such a case was it appropriate to regard the insurer as the real party, and that's a phrase we've come across before, such that a section 51 order could be made, uh, and otherwise that no order should be made. So they took quite a stark position about the meaning and effect of those earlier authorities. But the Court of Appeal, um, Lords Justice um, Patton and Lewis were having, having none of that. Um, the attitude they took was that the court was not constrained by the facts and the outcomes of those prior insurer non-party cost cases. Uh, and they treated them instead as guidance rather than as travellers seem to be suggesting, uh, as rules or conditions of liability. Um, now, when it comes to the basis of um, on, on which the Court of Appeal upheld the order, uh, the Court of Appeal took the view that travellers had, as they undoubtedly had, funded the defence and had stood to benefit from a successful outcome. Um, and they took the view that they that therefore placed travellers' conduct squarely within the principle that one found, finds in Dimmock's. Uh, I noticed that Jeremy pronounced it differently, but it's, it's not a word I've ever um, heard said out loud, so he could be right and I, I could be right, I don't know. But the Court of Appeal also went on to consider what it described as the principle of reciprocity. And this cropped up in Lady Justice Thurwell's judgment, but, um, but was treated by the Court of Appeal as being really the most important reason for finding that travellers should be liable. Um, and this was that um, reciprocity, as the Court of Appeal conceived it, required that travellers um, should pay the uninsured claimant's costs in circumstances where if travellers had become entitled to its costs, it would have expected to be paid its costs by uninsured as well as insured claimants. Uh, and an associated consideration was this, and that was that it was a matter of pure accident that the test cases, the sample cases, had comprised a mixture of insured and uninsured cases. Whereas travellers' expectation uh, when concluding the contract of insurance would have been that it would be liable to pay all of the adverse costs of an unsuccessful defence. Um, um, so that's reciprocity and, and also symmetry. That's another phrase that cropped up in the Court of Appeals judgment. So what was required as a matter of justice was a symmetry 
um, between the positions of the claimants and the defendants in terms of their actual and theoretical cost liabilities. And that, that, that was, and that's what made it necessary to impose a non-party cost order on travellers in those circumstances. Um, travellers, of course, appealed to the Supreme Court, and we'll be hearing um, more about that in a moment. But before we do, um, I just want to say something about the Jambrone case. And those of you who tuned in early would have heard Jeremy's introduction, so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, say this, and, th and that, is, that apart from giving this talk, I think this must be the first year for about 10 or 11 years that I haven't done any work on this case. Um, but I mean, it's facts, and this is a complex case, um, factually and legally, but happily we didn't have to go into very much of the underlying detail. In Jambrone, there were um, some hundreds of British and Irish claimants who paid what for them was substantial amounts of money um, to purchase holiday properties at a development on the Calabrian coast, and this is in um, South uh, Western Italy. Um, and and that, that was a development called the Jewel of the Sea. Now, of course, um, the development was never completed. Um, and what prevented that was that it was seized in, I think, 2013 by the Italian financial police on the basis that it, it was um, the developer who was developing the development was a creature of the local mafia, um, collaborating um, in rather an unfortunate um, example of organized crime and its globalization with the IRA. Um, in some scheme to launder the proceeds of drug, drug tra trafficking in Northern Ireland. But anyway, that's a, a side detail. Um, so the development is never um, completed. No prospect whatsoever of the substantial deposits being recovered from the developer. And so the claimant sued the Italian lawyers who were practicing in England and Italy, who had acted for them in these transactions. Uh, now, the claimant succeeded both at first instance and in the Court of Appeal. Um, but Jambrone's insurers, AIG, paid none of the damages or equ equitable compensation, as it was, uh, nor the costs. And that was because they argued that they were entitled to aggregate the Jewel of the Sea claims. And that certainly by the time that our claims had been made, they'd already paid out the total, total sum insured under the policy in respect of any one claim. So a familiar situation in insurance coverage situations. So uh, the claimants, no surprises, applied for a non-party costs order against AIG. Now, Mr. Justice Foskett, who like um, Lady Justice Thurwall in um, the XYZ case, had been the trial judge, ordered AIG to pay half of the claimants costs of the proceedings. Um, now, um, AIG sought a leapfrog certificate permitting an application to appeal directly to the Supreme Court so that it could be their appeal could be heard with the Travellers case, but we resisted that um, and it was denied. But the Court of Appeal then gave AIG position, permission to appeal, which is, as you've heard, when Jeremy got involved. Now in Jambrone, um, so far as the long party costs um, order was concerned, the key features very much in summary, which the judge identified were that AIG had settled all the previous Jewel of the Sea claims. Um, then a dispute as to aggregation, aggregation had arisen between AIG and Jambrone, it's insured. And given the number of claims still in the pipeline, and I think most of those were our claims, that obviously raised the prospect of uninsured losses. And um, in the normal way, once the limit of indemnity was finally eroded, and I think there was 30 odd thousand pounds left by the time our claims were brought, um, AIG would have no liability to indemnify Jambrone against the costs of defending further claims. Now, how was that situation to be resolved? Well, AIG and Jambrone did a deal. They entered into something which was described as heads of terms, which um, for the purposes of the non-party cost application had two material effects. The first was that AIG and its insured agreed a compromise basis of aggregation. Um, and that, that found a middle ground between two positions. AIG was arguing for really quite a narrow, um, um, or oh, sorry, I suppose, I suppose broad basis of aggregation. And Jambrone was saying there was no right to aggregate at all. And so they reached a compromise, the effect of which was to make some money or further money available to settle claims, but not nearly enough substantially to compensate the many more claims which were already being made. Uh, secondly, 
AIG agreed to fund the defense of claims even after the exhaustion of that revised indemnity limit. Um, and but that was subject to an exception um, where it reasonably considered that there was no realistic prospect of defending the claims. Now, all of the claims in our um, Gembrano case were made after the conclusion of that heads of terms agreement and therefore they took and their defense therefore took place subject to its terms. And when it came to conduct, the judge said that the conduct of the defense had been, as he put it, unbalanced and at first blush unfair. Um, he was much moved by the fact that almost every issue that we had raised was hotly contested by the defendants. And although he recognized that some matters were conceded during the trial, that was only because they had become utterly untenable by that stage. Um, but his main consideration was that all major issues had fiercely been fought by the defendants. And that was even so, even despite the fact that without prejudice material, which had emerged and which was in evidence on the non-party costs application, had shown that the defendants um, and their legal advisors had very little confidence um, um, of success on most of the major issues. And of course they had, as I've already mentioned, settled the previous cases, which um, um, might, might show a similar lack of confidence in success. Um, ultimately, he concluded that this had been a war of attrition and he made his non-party costs order essentially on two cumulative or alternative, it's not really quite clear from the judgment, um, reasons. Uh, the first was that he treated the heads of terms as an agreement from which AIG had derived a commercial benefit, uh, and that was an agreement as to a basis of aggregation. And in return, and this is a phrase that AIG's own submissions had used, AIG had agreed to fund the defence costs with, um, outside and beyond the terms of the policy. Uh, and just pausing there, I mean, in the normal way, um, the liability of a liability insurer under a professional, uh, certainly a solicitor's professional indemnity um, insurance policy um, to pay defence costs um, will not go beyond the exhaustion of the indemnity limit. So once the money is run out for whatever reason, they no longer have to defend. Um, but nonetheless, they had agreed to do so. Um, under the heads of term. But they had also, so the judge found, relinquished control over how that defence was conducted. And um, the reason that the actual conduct was so important is that they basically, so the judge found, let the Gianbrone insured get on with it and take every point and argue the unarguable, etc. Um, and his alternative additional basis for finding AIG liable for non-party costs was that he decided that they had in fact been entitled to withdraw defence funding under the exception that I've mentioned, but had decided not to do so. Uh, and the reason that was particularly significant was that AIG's argument against the non-party costs application was that they had never at any stage done more than they were contractually obliged to do, whereas the judge disagreed. He could have stopped funding, uh, arguably should have stopped funding, but didn't stop funding. So what we see um, in Travellers and in Jambrone is the court treating the previous insurer cases merely as examples of the exercise of the non-party cost jurisdiction rather than as authority um, that different considerations applied in such cases. Um, and in so doing, the, both Travellers and Jambrone essentially treated the criterion of exceptionality and the ends of justice, which Jeremy has mentioned, um, as being the only considerations which are really that relevant to the making of such orders. Uh, now, it's fair to say, as many of you, as you, of you will know, um, the Travellers case in particular caused a degree of, well, quite a lot of consternation in the insurance market because of a feeling, and um, I think an understandable feeling, that um, the post-Travellers and post-Gembrone um, liability insurers were now unclear uh, about what they could or couldn't do um, in terms of finding themselves liable for something that they routinely do, and that is to pay for the defense of proceedings um, and proceedings which might fail. Uh, there was also a sneaking suspicion um, held by me and I suspect lots of others that um, a differently constituted court of appeal and travelers might have come to, um, to a different conclusion. The judges, very eminent judges, um, though they undoubtedly are, the Lord Justice Patton and Lewis are chancery judges. Um, perhaps a different result might have um, um, occurred if there'd been at least one commercial judge, some people used. Jeremy. 
Thank you, Shantanu. Um, so we get to the stage where the Travellers case um, came before the Supreme Court. And of course, at this point, the Jambroni case um, had uh, not reached the Court of Appeal. Um, the critical passages for the purposes of the decision in Travellers are to be found at paragraph 76 to 83 of Lord Briggs' judgment, if you just want to go straight to the heart of it. Um, it seems to me that the, the key points that one can distill from Travellers are these, that exceptionality, which was at the heart of the Jambroni decision by Mr. Justice Foskett, and the Court of Appeals decision in Travellers, exceptionality or a broad appeal to justice are not or seem unlikely to be, um, according to Lord Briggs, a useful test. They lack content, they lack principle, and they lack precision. And although Lord Briggs didn't state the point quite so confidently as uh, Lord Reed put it. It's very obvious if you actually read Lord Briggs' judgment um, that uh, it would be pretty remarkable if ever he were to be persuaded that the whip of the statement of principle by Lord Reed uh, uh, is wrong. Rather, uh, Lord Briggs said, uh, rather than exceptionality, the focus is to be on whether the insurer non-party has become either the real defendant uh, in relation to an insured claim or has intermeddled in an uninsured claim. It's the insurer's conduct that matters, not the exceptional nature of the case. Next, an insurer will be seen as the real defendant where it has been influenced to obtain for itself some advantage alongside, uh, uh, outside um, the litigation. Um, and we see that that harks back to a decision of the Court of Appeal in the 1930s in Groom and Crocker. But there are the other cases that uh, Shantanu mentioned as well, TGA Chapman, uh, and uh, the uh, Travellers case at paragraph um, 77. But what does that mean? What is becoming the real defendant? Could we have the next slide, please? Dealing with an uninsured claim may expose the insurer to a charge of intermeddling, but a close claim a close connection with an insured claim per Lord Briggs may well mean that legitimate interests of the insurer will justify some involvement by the insurer in decision making and even funding of the defense of the uninsured claims without exposing the insurer to liability to pay the successful claimant's costs. Now, in practice, it's not difficult to think about that kind of situation. Suppose you've got on their way to trial two groups of cases, in one of which the insurer accepts that the insurer is liable to pay. So if there is a trial and the insured loses, the insurer is going to have to pay out. But then there may be another group of cases um, in which the insurer is uh, not going to be liable. Perhaps he wasn't the insurer. Uh, perhaps uh, there is a, a, an unanswerable policy dispute. Well, sometimes it may be very adverse to the insurer's commercial interests to have a parallel case that's going to be badly handled perhaps even by an unrepresented defendant. And so the insurer may take the view, perfectly bona fide, that the insurer would rather fund that 
uninsured case, even provide representation in an uninsured case to make sure that there is a harmony of argument as to the submissions uh, that are being advanced. So it's easy to see why insurers might, in certain circumstances, decide that they do not wish there to be uh, rival camps putting forward different submissions. And it seems to me that it's that sort of situation that uh, Lord Briggs had in mind uh, when he uh, identified uh, this uh, very clear carve out of any potential liability. Lord Sumption as well made a very important observation in paragraph 116 in the judgment, where he said that a large margin of judgment should be allowed to an insurer if he acts in good faith and in the interests of the assured. Now, suppose that you have a coverage dispute between an insured and an insurer, and the insurer says, well, all right, um, we will, if, if you accept that there is to be a cap on our liability, we will cover the insurance, um, we will honor the insurance commitment up to this point, perhaps up to a percentage or perhaps up to a, a fixed sum. Now, that may very well be seen as a classic case for saying, well, that's in the area of uh, an insurer's genuine judgment uh, where there ought not to be a second guessing of what was in the, the insurer's commercial interests um, by a court at a later time. Causation is another critical factor. It has to be proved in demonstrating a link between the insurer's conduct and incurring of costs by the claimant. So if the claimant would have incurred just the same costs, whether or not the insurer had become involved, there wouldn't be uh, a proven causation. Uh, and finally, um, it seems that the non-disclosure of limits of cover, which was so important, at least at first instance in travelers, is unlikely to trigger liability that per Lord Briggs at paragraph 80. Now, I think uh, that that brings us on to the topic of gray areas. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, we have identified a few. There are plenty of others, I'm sure. But the first gray area is this. Are the categories closed? Is it just being the real party or being an intermeddler? that exposes an insurer? Uh, is it really the case that it will never be possible outside of those situations to uh, recover? Well, the Supreme Court didn't say anything definitive on that point. But all we can observe is that there was not much encouragement in any of the judgments for any other category of case. Sorry to repeat this again, exceptionality is not going to be a get out. So one always has to look at the facts of a particular case, obviously, and then whilst travellers remains the highest authority on the, on the subject, go back to travellers and, and see where it leaves you. But I think I speak for both Chantanou as well as myself in this situation, when I say that there isn't much hope for escaping from um, these two tests that were identified in travelers. Um, unless you've got anything you want to add on, on that one, Shantanu, I think we're on to the second gray area, so over to you. Yes, well, perhaps I would just say some one more thing, which is kind of loosely linked to this first grey area, and that is this question, and that's whether uh, the effect of the judgment in travellers is that, uh, that the categories um, are distinct and the considerations which um, apply to each of them 
apply only to the cases which they contemplate. So in other words, you have a, um, an insured case and the only circumstances in which an insurer can be liable in an insured case is by becoming the real defendant. And similarly, are the intermeddling um, aspects or the intermeddling considerations only applicable to uninsured cases? Is there scope for overlap or cross application of some of the considerations depending on the facts? Um, now, I don't know what the answer to that question is. It's something that to some extent came up when, we, when Jeremy, and I, uh, Jeremy and I were considering what to do in the Gembrone appeal, which was rather overtaken by the decision of the Supreme Court in Travellers. And it certainly struck us that there might be scope because this remains a fact sensitive jurisdiction, even though um, it's regulated and narrowed and restricted by the decision of the Supreme Court and travellers for a degree of cross fertilization be um, between the two categories, depending on the facts. But I don't know what you think about that, Jeremy. Shantanu, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the last few words you said. No, I'm just saying, I, I was just asking you whether you agree that there was scope, depending on the facts of a particular case, for. Um, certain of the factors that might be relevant to making um, an insurer liable for intermeddling to apply to an insured case. Yes, oh yes, certainly. Yeah, I, I completely agree with your observations about that. Yeah. Um, so grey area too, and as, I, as we say, these are uh, amusing, certainly not intended to be exhaustive, and I'm sure that many of you will be able to think of lots of others. Um, but, the, but the next question we thought of is, what is the relevance of benefit to an insurer? Um, and we, we've already seen from the discussion about Jan Brone was that Mr. Justice Foskett was uh, influenced in making his order against AIG by the fact that AIG had derived a commercial benefit from entering into that heads of terms agreement. Um, but how relevant, if, if at all, is that to in the imposition of liability in the light of travellers? Um, now, in the situation we posit on this slide, I mean, we recognize, of course, that it's going to be a fairly unusual situation where an insurer is going to want to spend money um, defending a claim for which it is not liable to indemnify the insured under the policy. Um, and you might think, actually, that they're much more likely to do the opposite. But um, imagine this situation, uh, and this is the third bullet point on this slide. Uh, suppose that you have an insurer who is anxious to get a favourable decision uh, on some really important legal principle that affects something that comes up a lot, it affects various other cases that um, they're insuring. And they identify a particular case brought by a claimant as a really weak one, um, which it might be suitable to defend and obtain a decision in as some kind of test case. Now, at the same time, um, there's a underlying coverage consideration, which means that the insurer um, has some cast iron defense to liability as against its insured under the policy. Now, what happens in that situation if an insurer decides to fight that case um, in order to obtain the decision on a test case, um, um, even though it won't be liable to indemnify its insured um, uh, under the policy? Well, uh, at the risk of weasel words, it, it, it strikes me that it's going to depend on the facts, but you can see that that opens up the possibility of liability. And one doesn't want to mix up what, is, what are conceptually distinct things, in other words, liability and causation. But I suppose we have here a situation where um, the case might not have been defended at all if the insurer hadn't funded it. Um, so that's what, what one is looking at. And, um, but, but I, it seems to me there's no easy answer to this question, because once you accept, as the Supreme Court does, that insurers are in business to make money and that the service that they provide is one which is in the public interest. It seems to me there's really quite a lot of scope for the insurer doing things which it is, is in its commercial interest without incurring liability. Uh, and whether it does so or not is going to depend on the facts and where you draw the line on those particular facts. Now, Jeremy, I don't know what you think about that. I, I find this a really quite tricky one um, because it, it, it seems to me that it, it could well be said by the insurers that this is within the wide margin of judgment that Lord Sumption recognised that insurers should have. And 
if they are fighting a case on behalf of an insured, um, well, it is for the insured's benefit. And I, I think that they, they can make a very powerful argument as to why it's not intermeddling and why it's not a case of the real party. And uh, I would have thought this point is one that is quite likely to come up at some time in the future. Um, th th there's a practical problem facing the claimant, though, who wants to establish a Section 51 order, and that is that the insurer is hardly likely to come out saying openly, well, we're only running this case because we're treating it as a test case, we're, and, and we think this could be useful to us in the future. And so actually laying the groundwork to establish the point that is described in bullet point three may very well in practice be difficult for a claimant. But I do find this a, a quite a tricky point, I have to say. It, it really is a gray area. Yes, and as I say, at the risk of ducking the issue, I think it is going to depend very much on the facts, if you can ever actually get at them. Um, but certainly my experience in the Joan Brone case, which is that, I mean, like everything else, the non-party cost application was complex and long drawn out, and we had four days of argument, uh, which seems almost unbelievable, but um, it seemed somehow necessary. And there was a great deal of excavation um, of the underlying facts and the admission and consideration of without prejudice correspondence. Um, so at least to that extent, we've found out things which we um, um, wouldn't otherwise have known, but the joint privilege as between Jambrone and AIG was not waived. And so what we didn't know is what, the com what communications were going on between them um, as to why the litigation was being run and who was controlling it. And if you, of course, if you can't find that out, then you can't establish some platform from which the judge is nonetheless prepared to draw an inference, then I suspect the insurer is going to be given the benefit of the doubt in many of these situations. You, you do, of course, get some cases where, although there is nothing in the reported facts to indicate that it became clear that the insurer was only running this as a test case, you do get the odd case um, the parking eye case springs to mind um, as, as the kind of case um, of this nature, um, where a case goes all the way to the Supreme Court over a dispute about five pounds. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is the sort of case where it's reasonable to infer that the case was being run purely to establish a point of principle where, in fact, um, the commercial consequences of in the individual case were of no importance to the insurer. Maybe this one, maybe this third bullet point is one that will eventually come before the courts, and uh, I'll be very interested to see what they do with it if it should if it should ever do so. Yes, although I suppose I mean on the facts we posit, the um, situation is unlikely to arise because I suppose if the claimant's case is a really weak, weak one, then they're not going to get an order for the payment of its costs anyway. Um, Unless, um, as does sometimes happen, the result doesn't go the way that everybody expects. Yes. And as we all know, uh, that happens from time to time in litigation. Absolutely. All right, we're well, moving on to another grey area. Um, and that's yes. um, an insurer doing a deal to close a coverage dispute. Yeah, it, 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 if you, I mean, this, this case, this point, of course, was one that actually arose in Jambrone, um, as you've described. Um, but Jambrone settled before the case got to the Court of Appeal. So at appellate level, it was never the subject of a decision. Um, in Jambrone, as we can see from the first instance judgment, the commitment to conduct uninsured cases was actually formalized. But the critical question in the light of travelers is whether there was a close connection between the insured and the uninsured cases and an advantage genuinely perceived by the insurer in terms of the conduct of the insured cases and the insurer is to be allowed a wide margin. Mm 
um, in that uh, respect. So all of those questions um, would, had Jan Browning actually been heard in the Court of Appeal, had to have been addressed. Um, and uh, so we will, because of the, the fact the case didn't reach the Court of Appeal, we won't know what the Court of Appeal would have made of the case um, on those particular facts. Um, any thoughts on that, Shantanu? No, well, it's difficult to say much. I mean, it wants to betray our kind of underlying thinking or advice, but I mean, one could undoubtedly see, certainly in the Jambrone facts, as I described them, that there were arguments both ways. I mean, very much our, the core of what we were saying was that they had, you know, this was a, a new agreement and it had gone beyond their existing contractual obligations, but one can quite see that, um, there was an argument to be made by the insurers that what they'd done was completely legitimate and particularly because it compromised an existing dispute about coverage under the policy. Um, but as Jeremy says, it's um, we'll never know what the answer was. Um, and finally... I suppose so the, 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 an interesting question would be whether there is any point of principle that if no agreement is ever formalised but the insurer simply behaves in a particular way, is the insurer in the clear? Whereas if they actually do a commercial deal with their insured, does that trigger a liability? That's a question that, again, is is probably, um, uh, well, it, it, it may one day come before the courts. Um, so it, we have there another potentially gray area. I think over to you on the fourth point, Shantanil. Yes, yeah, so we've already touched on it because it was relevant to the, the second point. And this is um, Lord Sumption's point about margin of judgment. Um, and, and I thought what I might do is just quickly read out what, what, the entirety of what he says about this. He, you know, he, talk, he says, and this is in the paragraph where he deals with unjust, unjustifiable in, intermeddling. But you can see how it's potentially relevant also to the real defendant category. He says, this is an area in which a person conducting or directing the conduct of litigation is entitled to a large margin of judgment and hindsight is not usually an adequate tool for assessing how he exercises it. If he acts in good faith in the interest of the insured, assured, quay the defendant to insured claims, he should not incur liability and costs. As a present advice, I would expect this to be equally true of the case where the potential liability of the assured is subject to a limit of cover which is exceeded. But that is not an issue which needs to be examined on this appeal because it does not arise on the facts. Um, now, as I say, we've already touched on this. And I, and I think, it, it, again, it really springs from a, a recognition of the obvious fact that an insurer is in business to make money, um, but that it should provide insurance is in the public interest. And I think it's the combination of those two features um, uh, recognised um, centrally in the Supreme Court judgment, which is going to make it very difficult to impugn a good faith decision by an insurer. Um, and uh, I was just trying to think about parallels. I mean, the tests would be different, but I suspect that it, we're going within the territory of, um, of difficulty, um, which one encounters when one is trying to impugn a bona fide commercial decision made by a director of a company. It's that sort of thing. Um, and you know, hindsight is never a reliable or accurate guide to what should have been done, just because you can say with the benefit of hindsight that this might have been the better course. Um, so I think there are going to be real difficulties in, uh, in, a, um, in impugning the insurer's judgment. Um, and the key question, of course, is that it, is, it was made bona fide. And I think in, yeah. unless that is capable of being undermined, then the, the sorts of case in which one's going to be able to challenge a commercial decision made by an insurer are going to be pretty few. Well, it, it's not very often in the real world that one comes across an insurer uh, who's thinking, this is fantastic. I can spend some money on getting involved in somebody else's dispute in which I have absolutely no interest. And I, I, I think that as we've set it out in our last bullet point, um, as Adam Smith said as long ago as 1776 in The Wealth of Nations, and, it, and he, he wasn't uh, perhaps the first person to think of this, that it's not from benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard to their own interests. And insurers are going to say, that observation applies just as much to us. And uh, we got involved in this case 
because we thought it was in our own interest to do so and to take this point. And we are, thank you very much, within Lord Sumption's wide margin. The only thing I should say about Lord Sumption um, and what he said is, is this, and it is necessary, obviously, if you're looking at a case in this field, to look very carefully at what all of the substantive speeches contained. But as I read the judgments, um, whilst it is clear that there is huge overlap um, between Lord Briggs and Lord Reed, and no real inconsistency at all, and other members of the court express that to be the position, I don't think any other member of the court actually specifically endorsed Lord Sumption's wide margin. Um, so there's another point that might arise in a future case. Is, there, is, is, it really, is it mandatory to have a wide margin? I, I think it would be sensible to work on the basis that that will be expected. Um, but I don't think that that is, at least at the moment, underscored um, by a majority in the Supreme Court. Um, I think, uh, unless there's anything more on that, Shantanu, that you wanted to add, we can now deal with a few questions. In fact, there was just one thing, in it, but it's not on the thing we were just talking about. And I'm just going to just draw people's attention, for those who um, haven't yet read the whole of the Supreme Court judgment in Travellers, to um, what it says very briefly in passing about the non-party cost jurisdiction generally. Because there is a passage in um, the speech of Lord Briggs, who gives the main judgment, where he says it's not the purpose of this judgment comprehensively to reassess the, those generally applicable principles, in other words, exceptionality, ends of justice. And he says it may be, and I'm reluctantly prepared to assume, but without deciding, that they really are limited, as the Court of Appeal thought in the present case, to the twin, twin considerations of exceptionality and justice. But he says that I share all Lord Reed's concerns as to the lack of content, principle, or precision in the concept of exceptionality as a useful test. Um, and we haven't taken you to what the rules say about non-party costs order, but, the, the, um, but it's, it, it wouldn't have helped us because they don't say anything. The court has the power to order them. Um, but the only guidance one gets are the notes in the white book about what, have been, what has been done in other cases. Um, now, I don't think there's going to be a, a more general non-party cost case getting to the Supreme Court anytime soon. And in some respects, it was quite exceptional that they were prepared to take the traveller's case because you know, the, the guidance, conditions, all the rest of it in this sort of procedural area is really very much a matter for the Court of Appeal. But I think it's a measure of the um, importance with which the traveller's point in relation to insurers was regarded that su the Supreme Court decided to take a case on procedure. But one does see, certainly at the very highest um, um, echelons of the judiciary, some concern about the way that the non-party cost jurisprudence has developed, or one might say has not developed since um, aid and shipping and Interpol. You know, one really doesn't know um, when one is going to be liable. It's all going to depend on what the judge thinks um, um, thereafter, if you make such an application. Now, there are so now Jeremy asked about questions. There are um, an encouraging number of people who are still with us. Um, so I'm just going to look to see whether there are, um... yes, well, there is an understandable question um, um, about legal expenses insurance. And the question is, will the principles you are discussing also apply to legal expenses insurance? Um, and um, I mean, I think that the short answer to that, and we touched on that when Jeremy was talking about um, the, the kind of general jurisprudence is that, uh, legal expense insurers are in a different category in some respects. I mean, they're, that they serve a public interest in widening access to justice is something which is um, very much recognised in a number of the cases. But the, the general principle is that uh, like all, um, uh, and I say all non-insurer funders of litigation who stand to benefit from funding that litigation, they are in principle liable to pay the costs of a successful claimant or defendant, whichever side it is. Um, and whether or not that's subject to a cap, the so-called Arkin cap, um, corresponding to the amount of money they actually contributed to the funding of the litigation is another matter which will depend on the facts of the case. But in principle, they are liable. But the, 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 the particular considerations that apply in the insurer cases do not apply uh, 
um, to commercial litigation funders who are not insured. Yeah. Um, I, don't know what I, I agree. There's a, a world of difference between commercial litigation funders and uh, third party expense insurers. Um, a litigation funder actually is going to be sharing in the proceeds of the litigation. And that's why um, English law, they're treated as the real party, and Scots law, they're treated as a, a, a dominus litus. Um, so I, I don't think that one can equate a third party expense insurer with a litigation funder. It seems to me a, a, a third party expense insurer is going to be treated precisely the same as any other insurers. The, the, the twin questions, are they the real party? Are they intermeddling? And the, the, the answer to their liability is almost certainly, if you take the, the view that I expressed earlier as, as correct, I, the, their liability is almost certainly going to depend upon whether they're intermeddling or whether they're the real party. Good. Right, well, it's now 12.08, and um, still a surprising number of you who are with us, but you must have something better to do than listen to us. Um, so I, I, I'll finish really just by thanking all of you who've joined us this morning. Um, you would have noticed that our slides um, were um, hardly minimal. We treated them as really as a kind of hybrid between bullet points and a handout. There is no handout. Um, and I could see when I was scrolling through them while we were talking that there were a few typos. But once we've picked up on those, um, we will make them available to you um, just in case some of the references um, uh, case descriptions, etc., are useful. Um, and there will also, with the, this um, webinar is being recorded, um, in the highly unlikely event that anyone of you is going to want to watch it again, it will be available in due course on Chamber's YouTube channel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.